about where Jews are at right now and how the current moment is an expression and amplification of, and certainly um, a crisis and hopefully an inflection point for Jewish historical trauma. Well, one of the impacts of the current events is that this fault line that's been developing inside the Jewish community for quite some time is now just cracked wide open. Wide open, yeah. Where you have, um, especially on generational lines, but not completely, where you have a lot of Jews now who are utterly appalled at what's going on. And uh, then is the mainstream um, institutions that continue to uh, really vociferously support, justify um, 10 Palestinians is losing their legs every day and everything else that's going on. So where is that coming from? From a perspective of trauma, there's such a thing as individual trauma, then it's collective trauma. And it's collective trauma lives in the memory of the collective. But it seems to function just like individual trauma does. Now, one of the impacts of trauma, there was an interesting article in the New York Times reporting on this, mind you, it was in, in November of last year. Mind you, that was already not news in the trauma world, but every once in a while, the New York Times discovers uh, the wheel, you know? So they, <laughs> so, they, uh, so they had this article about how, showing that in the brain, when traumatic memories take over, the rational parts of the brain go offline. You can show this on brain scans. Now, and people go into a state of fear and aggression, flight or fight, and traumas that happened long ago seem like they're happening now, so that the present becomes the past and the past becomes the present. I've written about this extensively. I've experienced it personally. You guys have seen me experience it, where something in the present sets me off and it's like not in the present, but I'm reacting to an, an old event. Now, when you look at Jewish culture, with all the beautiful and many things about it, many things admirable and, and, and um, unique about it, but along with all that, there's always a sense of insecurity and a sense of uh, fear if you go to the major Jewish holidays that have a story associated with it, I'm not talking about the spiritual holidays like Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, which have no uh, historical narrative attached to it. But the holidays like the holidays like Hanukkah or Passover or uh, Tisha B'Av. Yeah. Or um, Purim. Purim. Yeah. There's always the story. And the story always is that in every generation that rise up against us, they want to kill us. And those are the stories that we tell our kids around the, on the table. It's true. Four times a year. Mm -hmm. You know, now we manage to triumph, but the warning is in every generation, they're going to rise up against us. Mm -hmm. And so when something like October the 7th happens, which by any account was a horrific event, if you actually are ahistorical, as the Israeli historian Ilan Papi calls it, ahistorical, ahistorical, meaning if you don't know what happened in Palestine, if you don't know, then October 7th seems just like yet another pogrom of the worst sort. And the line is, this is the worst yeah. massacre of Jews yeah. since the Holocaust, yeah. right? As if, as if October 7th had... So the, the killings happened because these were Jews. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and whereas, you know, as somebody said, if dinosaurs had occupied and, or Germans or Vikings, Vikings, they, the Palestinians would still be fighting against them. Yeah. Now, they're not fighting because they were the fighting against Jews. But the point is that with an ahistorical perspective, if you haven't, if you grew up with the mainstream view of what's happened in Palestine, and we're the victims, we're trying to make peace, they're always attacking us. And October 7th is just another revivification of that old traumatic wound. And then where are you going to react from? The defensive parts of your brain. And you're going to be in fear mode and you're going to be in aggressive mode. In fact, you're going to be both of them at the same time. Yeah. And so I get these messages, you know, um, 
Somebody writes on my website, uh, have you dissociated so deeply that you're numb to your own people's genocide? Have you converted to Islam? Are you a martyr? When you're in that traumatized state, you can't think of any alternatives. Yep. And you can't think of any kind of a rational response. Apart from the genuine pain that people have about people having been killed on October 7th, their relatives abducted, or a country they love being attacked. I mean, apart from the, just, you know, those are normal human responses to pain and rage in response to that. But there's also this um, re wounding of the trauma. I mean, it happens, you're not thinking rationally. And so that anybody even criticizes Israel or points out that there's another story. Now we become uh, t terrorist supporters, and we, we, obviously we're Hamas spokespeople, and and because there's such a thing called integrative thinking. In integrative thinking, you can hold two opposing ideas or two contradictory ideas at the same time, which is that Jews have suffered, and there's Palestinian suffering. And maybe there's a way to understand that. But in this world, there's only our suffering. And their suffering is purely self-created. And we can't help but make them suffer because they're making us do it. Right. So it's a trauma response. I mean, apart from being a political response and a colonial response and, and you know, a dominating response on the part of the Israeli government, on the part of individual Jews and communities, there's a lot of unresolved trauma in it. It occurs to me that another binary that the non-integrative mind can't hold is our suffering and our responsibility. Yeah. Our victimhood. Yeah. And our accountability. Yeah. Right? Our agency. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a strong, um, <clears throat> almost a magnetic repulsion against any suggestion that Israel might have something to do with and our support for it might have something to do with was how we got here. Yeah, Aaron, how about you? I also think there's the summer camp factor. You know, you, you know, for in our case, growing up in a summer camp where we associate all these wonderful memory as feelings, uh, experiences uh, with being Jewish and being connected to Israel, something like this happens. You know, the experience of going through that, especially as your brain is developing, it's going to set up a contradiction, and you're going to be, you know, conflicted between. I think your deepest conscience, but also what you've been conditioned to believe and how you then associate the parts about yourself and your life that you love with, you know, your friends and memories from wonderful experiences like going to a Zionist summer camp and or birthright or birthright or, or whatever it is. I was speaking to someone here in Vancouver last night who is a straight down the middle of the road, Vancouver mainstream Jewish community member in good standing, hmm. who is broken inside by what's happening hmm. and by their, I won't reveal who they are, or their gender, or anything like that, yeah. by their um, sudden or finally blooming awareness that something is deeply, deeply wrong, not just with Israel or Zionism, but with the Jewish community here that reflexively and dogmatically and desperately supports it. Yeah. And one of the main concerns about speaking out is the implications it will have for this person's relationship with their parents mm. and the re very real possibility that the parents will want to have nothing to do with them mm -hmm. and thus nothing to do with their own grandchildren. Yeah. That is intense. And that is a whole other order of collective trauma. But you guys have, you've lost friends, haven't you, over this? I think I weeded out those people a long time ago. Did you? Uh, there, there's some friends who probably are keeping their distance. Keeping their distance. But, yeah. you know, the younger generation, though, seems... Yeah, it, it's not like it used to be. Now it's it's not cool anymore to be pro-Israel. I mean, and I, I was thinking about, I was wondering why that is. I mean, you know, it's very often that the younger generation is always more progressive, more yeah. open-minded. But I also wonder for younger people, you know, given that opportunities are not what they used to be, uh, economic prospects are more bleak, and, and given how embedded Israel is into the power structure, I wonder if the, it's easier to turn away from Israel because younger people just don't see anymore the buy-in to the power structure the previous generations have had. What's it going to get me yeah, if, I, exactly. if I buy in? Yeah. And so it's easier then to mm. to be open-minded and to not accept the shackles that were given in order to advance. What about Hamas?